Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today we're talking about preparing for postpartum and going through postpartum during the coronavirus pandemic. And I have Grace Verasili. She is a New York City-based childbirth educator, a birth and postpartum doula, lactation counselor, and midwife's assistant. She began as a postpartum doula after the birth of her second daughter and over 10 years after starting to work as a birth doula. She's pretty amazing and pretty knowledgeable, and I knew that she would be the perfect person to really help unpack what's expected because postpartum right now, when we're in the middle of isolation, is a very different beast than postpartum normally. Normally, we are always talking about get help, get hands-on, and right now, that's not an option. So we talk about virtual help. We talk about preparing, what that means. So there's a lot that I think will be useful. And then I'm going to say, you know, in a year from now, it'll be nice to look at this and be like, how great that we got to the other side of that. I'm looking so forward to that moment. Also, I've had people reach out and ask about the classes we're doing. We've moved the whole entire PYC community online. I have to tell you, it's a little exhausting, but it's amazing at the same time. We are now offering seven days a week. We are doing our prenatal classes and re-releases. Caprice is still teaching her baby and me. I'm still doing postnatal. We've actually moved everything from partner yoga and massage to childbirth ed to CPR online because these are the times that we're dealing with and that baby is still coming or you just had that baby and you still need to figure these things out. So I am beyond thrilled that the team at PYC, we have mobilized and pivoted it and we are, we are there still being there for you. And that's, that's really exciting. And, um, I have a lot of gratitude that the teachers did this as well as gratitude for the students still showing up. What's been pretty amazing is now that we're doing these live stream classes, I check in with everyone. We still do circle time. And the other day we had someone from London. Another time we had someone from Romania. It's just, it's, it's just great that we're finally really encompassing the whole community, especially at a time where there's such fear. We're in such an unprecedented, ungrounded time. I'm so glad that we can still gather. All right, enough of me talking. We're going to take a super quick break and when we come back. Please enjoy my conversation with Grace. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, Grace. How are you tonight? Hi, Deb. I'm doing all right, considering <laughs> <laughs> considering everything that's going on and, um, you know, the fact that I um, You're we're doing now a this. homeschool teacher. <laughs> yeah, I'm now a homeschool teacher, which I never thought would be a thing for me. Um, and everything has to happen after the kids go to sleep. Like, I know. Every, every, every other part of life has to happen after they go to sleep. Yeah, let's get real for a minute. So community listening, our conversation, I promise, will not be about homeschooling kids, but... We're, but Grace and I, right Grace yeah. and I, are going to take a pause here. And it's eight thirty at night. We both have kids that are six and eight. We're both working parents, so we're going to take just a brief moment. 
and just, just say how much it sucks. Bit. Just say how much <laughs> it sucks. I'm sitting here like 8.30 at night. It's my time. I love to get work done at night, but it's like my chill work. Although I will say yeah. I'm back at my desk, which is so good because I've been working between the kids working and not really focusing. Like I'm kind of half doing their work and looking at my work and do it. Like it feels good to be back at the desk, but wow, yeah. this... To just be able to focus on one thing, I'm, totally. I'm actually a little concerned that after this next month, I may have a nervous breakdown. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, between, you know, with with the studio closed, I feel like I'm back when I open I the studio. Like the yeah, it's, um, I'm now teaching the majority of the classes. And, um, oh, wow. Because I, unfortunately I had to lay my teachers off because we're just, you know, we're closed. So it's, it's kind of a, a one woman show. Luckily I have some, my desk admin, um, and Caprice is still teaching, but wow, it's, it's an uphill battle. So, so we'll, yeah, we'll the, just take a beat and recognize really, that. Yeah. So when do you teach the classes? Um, we are just doing, like a- I'm doing my normal, I'm doing Monday, Tuesday, I'm teaching Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 a.m. And then prenatal and then a postnatal at noon on Wednesday. And then we're re-releasing them throughout the day. It's like, it's the best I could figure of on demand. Um, so the class I taught earlier, I released two more times throughout the day so people can have a chance to watch them. It was oh, kind of inspired from Peloton. <laughs> <laughs> That that makes a lot of sense though. Like to be able to like, oh, if I don't catch it at one, I could catch it at three. Uh, or yeah, exactly. Whatever. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. But it's it's it reminds me of when I kind of started up and you kind of shouldered the whole thing. But now, then I was you know single with no kids. Now I'm, I'm you know the Flash and Brick yeah. Drucker Academy um, with two rowdy kids, two <laughs> rowdy students that should get suspended. <laughs> No, oh God. All right. We well, just don't finish all the work that we're supposed to finish. And oh, yeah. You know, I, I feel bad, but at the same time, I feel too bad. I have threatened my son that he's going to have to go to summer school if he doesn't get the work done. <laughs> <laughs> they might all end up going to summer school. That's the thing. I know. So, it's so far. All right. Anyway. Well, let's pull uh, it together. So let's talk about I reached out to you because. I know that the other side of giving birth. So I did a podcast with Terry Richmond about preparing for birth during this pandemic, but we didn't, yes. we touched a little on the other side, but I think you have a great perspective on, you know, you do a lot of postpartum doula work on the other side of preparing for postpartum in this very, you know, unprecedented time. So I guess before we jump into that, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure. So we know that I have two daughters um, that are six and and, uh, eight, but I'm also uh, birth and postpartum doula. I was, I had stopped doing birth work, but I'm sort of like back in because, um, I just, I have all the expertise and, um, I'm also a childbirth educator and I teach childbirth ed classes and lactation classes and, um, newborn care. And then I'm also a certified lactation counselor. Um, and I started, studied with Lama. So I like, I know how to teach in different ways. And, um, but mostly I, I teach a lot about prenatally about like how to get ready for after you have your baby. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one of the things that has always been my kind of like my cup of tea, I guess you could say, I I love doing birth work. Um, but after, you know, having kids is just, it's really hard like be a, so um for that's what I was doing for like the longest time was just doing lactation support and postpartum support and that's changed a lot lately <laughs> I will say yeah yeah that's amazing that with your kids you can still get the birth work and I pretty much gave it up after my daughter was born my second it was yeah. just scheduling wise it was too much kind of lost you yeah yeah so because you have so much background in the postnatal or postpartum world Let's talk about how you're supporting your clients now, because in the past, and I had a postpartum doula for both my kids and especially my first, it was my lifesaver. I remember when my son was born, we literally thought, okay, we have three hours until the, until the doula is here. We can keep him alive and we can be functioning. And so I know how important it is to have that person 
with you. So how are you supporting people now that you can't be in their space? Right. So we're still trying to figure it out. This is like everything changes has changed so quickly that it's, it's sort of like a work in progress. Um, and we go, well, I go by just like what the client needs. Um, but it's, it's really hard, I would say to do it virtually as far as, you know, because my work has always been about my presence, you know, being there, being like the calm person in the room, the person that's like, you're doing fine, you're doing great. And so not being able to be there or to be like on a zoom for three hours, Mm. uh, makes it really hard, you know? So, but what I've been working with has been, um, doing like splitting. So my sessions used to be three hours long. Um, and so I split each session into like two or three check-ins throughout the day. So like, let's say when they come from the hospital, um, I'll say like the day after you come home from the hospital, let's check in in the morning and see like how the first night was and do you have any questions? And a lot of it is still about lactation support. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, trying to do lactation support virtually and then checking in like maybe later on in the afternoon and being like, so how were the last couple of feedings? Like what's, what, you know, how are, you know, moving on to like the next subject as far as like their healing their perineum, if they had a a C-section, like their scar, like how they're feeling as far as like pain and then giving them tips on how to do it. But it's, it's, you know, it's really hard because, um, depending on like what their situation is for a lot of people, it's just the two of them. Mm -hmm. So I've had several clients who, um, they left New York. So they're, they've been like self quarantining and then their parents at some point, like their parents are going to be there available to help them. But it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's still kind of like scary to know that if you, if your parent is over 60, that they're not going to be able to be, to be as supportive as they would have been otherwise, Mm -hmm. you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was starting, as I was preparing for us to chat, I was thinking about my biggest challenges with my first and I'll kind of go over them and then maybe you can talk about how someone can get some, some support or some planning or even just navigate without those extra hands. So my biggest thing was fatigue. (laughs) I just, I I really needed just to hand that baby off to someone. Um, Mm And then, and then I needed somebody just to teach me and which is strange because I had worked with newborns, but when it was my own and when it was that fresh and new, you know, certain things like bathing the baby and learning a good swaddle and of course breastfeeding. And then some of the practical things like cooking and cleaning and just like, I remember, I remember one of my postpartum duels just like making me pot after pot of red raspberry leaf tea, which I still love. And you know, like doing laundry. So how do you, how does somebody plan to navigate for just some of those practical obstacles that they're likely going to face? Right. So I was, I've been thinking about this a lot because, um, there is, there's so much more pressure now on the partner. If there is a partner, I really feel, um, really strongly for, you know, the people that don't have a partner, that's, that's everything is on them. So, Mm -hmm. um, the way that I've been thinking about it is like, is there a way that they can prepare? What can they prepare before? And then can they find someone in their community who, can self-isolate for the two weeks before their due date so that they can have someone that can sort of like be in a bubble and then they can like come into their bubble and be okay. You know, still washing hands, wearing masks, like doing all that stuff, but knowing that this person has been isolating for two weeks or longer and that um, they can be as safe as possible being around, you know, not only just the baby, but like new parents, like Mm -hmm. the thing that scares me the most is like, if you have two people and a baby, if one of those people gets sick, then the other person is like in a heap load of trouble because they're taking care of a brand new baby and they're taking care of a sick person that they can't really touch very much or be around very much. Um, so I think that if they can have support from someone that they know has been self-isolating, then that can be a really big, make a huge difference in their lives. Um, and then the other thing is like thinking about like the practical things that they're going to need, which is like food. So 
pre, you know, before having the baby, like trying to pack their refrigerator full of food, um, of like frozen stuff and doing it in like individual meals so that they can just like pull out a meal and like either pop it in the microwave or put it in the oven or, you know, steam it or whatever and have, have something to eat quickly. Um, and then having, if, you know, if their, their parents or their previous support people, you know, friends, family, are not able to be there um, physically, at least maybe they can be there, um, you know, financially. Mm. So they can provide, like, let's say, send them, pay for like a fresh direct order mm-hmm. so that they you know, do all this like cooking and planning um, or order from, you know, a pre-made healthy, you know, healthy, not, not, not a restaurant necessarily, but like if there's still like meal, meal prep, places that can, that they can order from that will deliver. So I know that, you know, a few months ago, uh, there were postpartum, um, meal doulas that used to like drop off food. And I think that some doulas, some postpartum doulas do that rather than like be there presently. Mm -hmm. They like do cooking and all the, all the shopping and then we'll deliver like a week's worth of food for you. Um, that's something that I personally can't do because I, you know, I just have to be with my kids and I, and I don't drive anyway. So um, that wouldn't necessitate a car, but I know some people that do that and that's the, you know, that's a way that they can like support their clients. Um, that makes a lot of providing at least like nerve. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I also think I'm going to just interject. I remember I was talking with a couple recently and they're like, well, now that, you know, cause we're doing all our stuff online, we're doing all our workshops now online. They're like, you know, it's not the same doing a, you know, a caring for newborn online than it would be in person. And I'm like, well, you don't have any choice right now. And I was basically saying, I'm like, you're so much better learning some of these practical skills, like swaddling on a doll without the pressure than when you are home by yourself with an actual baby trying to learn right. it. So I would say, yeah. I'm going to throw in the idea of like, take some time to learn these skills when the pressure is off, like get that stuffed animal, yeah. get that doll, practice putting mm-hmm. a diaper on. Cause you're not going to have the, you know, the family, the friends, the postpartum doula. And I can't, I'm actually also curious the hospital situations, like what's happening postpartum, how much time do the nurses have to dedicate to helping the new parents before, before they're heading home uh what i've heard is not a lot yeah so if they had very little time before then they have even less now um because they don't have as many as many nurses taking care of more patients so yeah so i totally agree about getting the doll and you know practicing with a stuffed animal i also you know as far as swaddling I'm like, it's okay not to do the origami on the baby. You know, it's okay to do the cheater swaddles with like the zipper and you just have your baby wrapped up and that's like easy peasy as opposed that's to like, so I true. To, yeah. you know, cause what they want is just to feel, you know, to feel enclosed and to feel warm and mm-hmm. you can achieve that in so many different ways. It doesn't have to be with like an Aiden and Anais blanket. Oh my <laughs> looks, God. I used you know, to say that it's funny cause I had so many and like, I, I got great at swaddling, but I remember like one time I had like my foot on one part of it while I was like hauling it <laughs> over and tucking it in and then an arm would escape and I'm like, get that arm back down. Yeah. It, or know. is the best way to describe it, which leads me to, let's talk about some things that people should think about stocking up on now so that they don't have to take so many trips out. I remember in the first week or so, I feel like we we're constantly running out to get something and running out to get, like, we don't want too much exposure once that new baby comes home. Exactly. Yeah, totally. So the number one thing that I would say other than food is diapers, like get a ton of diapers because you're going to go through them a lot. Um, so getting some newborn diapers and then some size ones diapers, like a few boxes, I would say like maybe even four boxes because, and then wipes, and anything that's sort of like cleaning the baby related, uh, because those are things that you go through a lot and you would normally have to go to the store and get them or like get, get them from Amazon next day. But now Amazon is not doing next day. So, Mm -hmm. um, you, those are things that you really just don't want to run out of. Um, in addition to that, I would say, um, 
you know, like getting like things like a lot of beans and cut up veggies that they can like have in their freezer. Um, and then all of the breastfeeding stuff, like having their pump, ordering their pump before they have the baby, I think is a really good idea. Um, because we don't know how long things are taking at this point. So if they can get like uh, a prescription from their, from their OBGYN so that they can order it before, um, I think that would be really, really helpful. And then getting something kind of like a Hakka style pump, something that will help with engorgement or leaking, um, or just have like a different way of getting the milk out of their breasts if mm-hmm. it's necessary. Um, that can also help. And then things like nursing bras, nursing pads, um, having a pair of comfy slippers that they can wear that they, you know, that they have, you know, um, ahead of time so that they don't have to think about like, oh, if I can just like go to Target and like pick up a pair of slippers there. Um, this is like not no time to be taking you know, little target breaks at all. So, Ooh, and also the big granny pads. Cause I think people forget yes. they bleed for a while. Exactly. That was, that was my next thing on the list okay. was having pads, <laughs> yeah. um, which you get some from the hospital, but eventually you're going to need your own. So ordering those ahead of time, um, can be super helpful too. Um, and then lastly, I would say like just thinking about like the possibility of some, one of them getting sick and then getting medication, you know, mm-hmm. getting like aspirin or Tylenol or maybe not aspirin, but Tylenol, um, and, and having anything that they might need if some, if one of them gets sick, because, um, having a new baby and then having a partner that is ill, um, it really makes it impossible to go outside. So having just ha- having that preparation, just in case, um, having extra soap, you know, for, cause they're going to be washing their hands a ton. And, um, let's see, what else was I thinking about? Moisturizer um, for their hands since they're washing them so yeah, much. Yeah, Moisturizer. Um, I think that's basically it. Like just stocking up on food and things that are not perishable. So mm-hmm. like maybe, um, bone broth that's like in the, in the packets, in the, like, um, the cartons mm-hmm. that are shelf stable so that they can make a soup really easily with like some some beans and some, some vegetables, like things that will make easy, nutritious meals, but that also keep for a long time. That, those are great uh, ideas. And then let's talk, cause you are a lactation counselor. Um, and then there are, luckily I know a lot of IBCLCs are doing virtual meetings, but because the parent, the new parents are not seeing a pediatrician, which we can talk about that as well as regularly. How does someone know if what's going on with breastfeeding? Because, you know, some, we all, hopefully people are taking a breastfeeding support before, but I know when I first had, when I had my first child, I was back and forth to the pediatrician so much. And she watched, she's like, let me see your latch. Why don't you take some time to sit and feed? And she was able to see how it was going. And I also had a lactation uh, consultant, uh, counselor, IBCLC, come and do a visit with me. So I did have a lot of support and I still needed some fixing on the latch. How does someone know if they need help? Like they have cracked nipples, they, their baby, I had someone just uh, yesterday, the day before, email me saying, my baby's having nipple confusion. I'm thinking maybe there's something going on with the tongue. Like there's a lot that someone's now trying to navigate on their own. So what are some signs that someone needs help with the latch? And then how do they find that help? Right. So um, the first signs that I would say are like, is the baby getting enough? Like, so just, I think people have to be even more uh, conscientious of like what your baby's trying to tell you. So if your baby seems hungry or unsatisfied, if they, if they're not having enough wet or, poopy diapers, that's a sign that they're not getting enough food. And that's the thing that I think most of us are worried first and foremost about. And then the second thing is nipple pain. So, um, and in that case, I think it's really beneficial to have someone who has a lot of experience in just taking a look. So having the partner there holding the phone so that the person who's breastfeeding or chest feeding is not the one that's like trying to hold a baby, trying to hold a phone at the same time and trying to talk. So just having someone who's like filming the situation and can go at a different angle and really 
um, get a little closer and see what the baby's doing with uh, a lactation consultant, a lactation counselor, or a lactation league leader, for example. Um, that can be really helpful as far as like seeing what the latch looks like. But then we are always going to have this issue of like, is the baby tongue tied or not? Because sometimes I, I've been in situations where I've been in their home. I've like looked under the baby. Baby's tongue and felt and etc. And like it's still not very clear. Like all of these other things that would um, lead me to believe that there was some kind of like tongue issue. So I think that's one of the things that is going to be really, really hard to cope with um, at this point. So I don't know how it is in other areas, but I know that in New York City there is the the New York um, sorry, the New York Lactation Consultants Association, which they have a hotline that you can call and then they'll set you up with a virtual, um, a virtual visit from someone. So, Mm -hmm. um, at least there, we know that there's help out there. It's just not the same kind of help. And it might be that a visit that took an hour before, it's going to take two hours before, I mean, now, because they have to sort of like play detective, you know, in, in so many different ways. And like, look at so many different things and ask so many other questions that they would just be able to see visually in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, But that, I mean, I think that at this point, this is the best support that they're going to get outside of the hospital. So new parents, well, pregnant people. So you guys should have these resources already drawn up ahead of time. You know, it's the local IBCLC that you can reach out to who does virtual meetings, all of these things so that, when you might be hitting that panic button, I very clearly remember a 3 a.m. panicked uh, text and email to my friend Andrea. <laughs> um, luckily, I had her number right there. <laughs> yeah. So that when they hit that moment of like, oh, my God, we really don't know what we're doing, they're not Googling in the middle of the night. So I guess part of this is really getting these resources already prepared. Yeah. And you were really lucky in the fact that you had Andrea, uh, who's amazing, (laughs) um, just kind of like at your fingertips. Yeah. She's, she's one of my mentors and she, I learned so, so much from her. Yeah. I was very blessed with her. So let's talk about also pediatricians. So I had put this out to, I've been doing these, um, PYC virtual community coffees because I'm like, we still need to connect. And I asked them, I'm like, so what are some of your concerns? And something that was brought up to me that I had no idea is that some pediatricians just closed. So I'm like, how is that possible? So I'm guessing so people should check in to see if their pediatricians open, which boggles my mind. And then also one thing someone said is that they're now doing teleappointments and this is for the community check to see if your insurance accepts that. But now that people are not having nearly as much interaction with their pediatrician, what are some things that they should know when something's a problem? Are there warning signs that they need to be like, okay, I need to see someone now? Right. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, kind of like, I I really don't understand how it's going to go down with pediatricians not being able to see brand new babies at first. I know that in my area, the pediatricians are doing at least a first visit and then doing tele, you know, telehealth after that. And a lot of the, um, of the, I I don't know how it's working out financially, but I think that it's, it's being put through so that it, it kind of like counts like a like a visit at the, at the clinic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say that, um, looking at your baby's color, seeing how, if they're like looking more yellow, so may, maybe taking pictures against the white background, um, every day to just check their color to That's see if they're getting idea. jaundice. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a way to just keep track of that. Cause sometimes like if you're seeing your baby every day, you don't really notice many changes. Um, and sometimes it takes like an outside person to see that they're looking kind of yellow, but if you have like the baby in the same position in the same background, then you are able to see from one day to the next that they're looking a little different. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing if they are, if your baby's just kind of, um, well, anything that, that might mean that the baby's like not getting enough food. So if your baby's mouth is kind of dry, if they seem worried if they are not pooping, if they're not peeing, um, if their belly button is, um, getting infected. 
So that is kind of a tricky one usually because most belly buttons, I don't know if you remember this from when your kids were little. It shocked me. I'm like, whoa. (laughs) Yeah. They kind of smell before they fall off. Um, So it doesn't mean that they're infected, but what the things to look out for are, you know, if there's redness at the base of the belly button, if there's any pus um, coming out of the belly button area, if there, if it's hot, if the area is hot, then that means that there's something else going on. Um, and then in addition to that, I would say, you know, if you have a baby with a penis, if they have been circumcised, just making sure that the circumcision is healing well. Um, and that if you, if there's anything that looks weird to like take a picture and send it to the doctor and then talk to them about it, um, something that they can see. Um, those would be things that are like pop out at me other than like the feeding issues that we discussed a little earlier. Mm -hmm. But what about, let's also switch slightly to the fact that we talked a fair amount about the baby, but Mm -hmm. the, the new parent that just gave birth, it's also a pretty precarious time. The first 42 days actually are the highest risk for something happening for the new parent. Um, yeah. And I'm going to attach in the show notes, I did a podcast about this, so I will make sure that's in the show notes, but what are some things that the, now this will be more on the partner because the person that just gave birth may not even be aware of this, but what are some warning signs for a partner or a family that's checking in or anyone that's checking in that's the, the new parent that just gave birth needs some attention? Mm-hmm. Well, I would say to start with just emotionally, um, I think that giving birth right now, um, it's kind of like fraught, you know, and, and there's, I just predict that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be, um, having to deal with the circumstances of their birth later on. Mm. Um, and so, you know, really checking in like on a regular basis with them and asking open-ended questions um, rather than saying like, are you okay? And they can say, yes, I'm okay. Or like, if they say I'm okay, then saying like, tell me more, tell me what's going on. Um, And just like being sort of like probing, but without probing, just like, you know, keep asking open-ended questions and seeing what's going on. And then asking them like, how are you feeling emotionally and how, you know, what are things that are bringing you joy right now? Is there anything that's bringing you joy? How is your appetite? Um, because those are things that might give you a sense, um, if the person is, is falling into depression or feeling anxiety, if they're not feeling any, um, any bonding with their baby, you know, after a certain amount of time, like not everyone feels immediately bonded to their baby, but you expect that to at some point take hold. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if it's been like a couple of weeks and they're still kind of like not really into it, um, then that would be something that I would, that I would like, that would raise a flag for me. Mm-hmm. You know, if like if they've lost their appetite and they are feeling really weepy, which of course happens to everyone, you know, you have the, the baby blues and so on, but if it's not going away, then that's something that you want to watch out for. And then and I was yeah, say, that's sorry. something that people should also, when we're talking about resources for, you know, an IBCLC or something in that extent, also having in that resource list, um, luckily in New York, we've got the motherhood center, but there's many different places of, of a, a mental health that someone yeah. should have available. So they're not again, Googling at that 12th hour. Totally. Yeah. And we have like the Seleni Center and there's um, a lot of people, a lot of like mental health professionals that are doing uh, virtual support as well. And Mm -hmm. what I tell everyone, even before COVID was, if you've ever had a therapist in your life, like if you've ever suffered from depression or anxiety, having a check-in before you have the baby is a way to kind of like leave a door open Mm -hmm. so that you can very easily go back and talk to that person and say like, Hey, you know, the first conversation would be like, Hey, I haven't spoken to you in a long time. Um, but I just wanted you to know that I'm pregnant and I'm, you know, having a baby soon. And I want to, you know, be able to check in with you after I have the baby. Um, and just have sort of like that, a person that they know is there and that they come to an understanding that they're going to be available for them. Mm, that's great. I love that idea. So mm-hmm. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. So what are okay. <laughs> it's just, there's so much. So uh, we're talking about warning signs. So there's yeah. the mental health warning sign, anything yeah. else that they should be aware of? Physically. Um, absolutely. So 
anything, um, they, you know, they, I think that it's really important to pay attention to what's going on with, um, any incision that's happened, that has happened. So any stitches, um, if it's a C-section, um, a C-section scar, like that it's not getting infected. So again, like if it's feeling hot, painful, if there's pus, that's something that your, that your, um, OB should be aware of and you should be, you should, you know, have someone, be able to go in and see someone about it. Um, but in addition to that, if there's any bleeding, if like bleeding increases after the first, I don't know, I would say like three days, like the bleeding in general should be um, decreasing with time. So if there's any point where the bleeding is increasing and it's more than one pad an hour, then that's a red flag right there that there's or something clots. Or like a yeah. big, big, I remember when, at first I always thought it was like a golf ball size and someone said the size of an egg. I'm like, that's a big clock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah. So those are things that you would call your, your doctor about immediately. Um, in addition to that, there's, you know, there's always a possibility, um, for postpartum, um, preeclampsia. Mm-hmm. So uh, excessive swelling, swelling in the hands and face feeling pain in the upper, um, like in the upper right quadrant of like the, like by the near ribs. Yeah. yeah. Near the liver. Um, what else? Um, headaches, flashy lights, flashy lights, being spots. Um, yeah. All those things, vomiting, those are things that they should watch out for. And that can be oh, really fever. dangerous fever in a fever. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, and um, blood clots, especially if someone had a C-section. So if they have yeah. a hot, swollen spot in one of their legs. Yeah. And again, I'm going to put um, some show notes. But these are definitely things that people may not think about. They're so overwhelmed with, you know, the isolation and then having a new baby that some of these things may not even be on their radar, which is, again, it does put more pressure on the partner. Someone may partner. just feel like, you know, of course I feel crappy and tired. I just had a baby. But it's the prolonged that we need to then keep an eye on. Do you know if care providers are doing any more check-ins because it's less FaceTime, like people are getting, uh, I was a dismissed release from the hospital pretty quickly. Do you know yeah. if there's more follow-up in any way? Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. I've been dealing with people that, um, have midwives. So, okay. um, and they always get follow-up like very, cons- you know, consistently. Um, I would imagine so because the, you know, the, the main idea is to like try to avoid people, you know, back. being around all people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And coming back to the hospital. So if they can, um, and I'm assuming that there's a lot more conversations about what to watch out for, like before they get discharged from the hospital and like when, you know, like all the things that we just talked about should be included in their packet, should be, you know, verbally spoken to them so that they're aware of things that they need to be on the lookout for. So this is something, so birthing community out there before your birth, you should check in with your care provider and just say, what should I expect? What kind of communication am I going to have? Is anyone going to follow up with me? How can we, you know, if I'm at, if I already have high blood pressure, how are we going to keep an eye on that? So I think this is good. So the more preparation and confidence, I think the better, something more confidence someone will feel. So so I guess it's really just communicating with your care provider to know their expectations. Exactly. Yeah. And I would say like what, what's happening now, as far as like COVID it's um, the, the changes that are happening are not so much what I, what I have always recommended for, for my clients is like, you know, the, in the postpartum period, you want them to stay home as much as possible. You want them to rest as much as possible. You want them to be in bed um, the first week and not be doing a whole lot of stuff, not going out and talk, you know, like, um, sorry, walking a whole lot or all of that. But the expectation before was that other people were going to be there mm-hmm. to provide all of the support that they would need. So, um, so thinking ahead, but also thinking about the fact that it's like, okay, so now we have to be stuck at home. There's no other place for us to go. Like, let's make this more of like a traditional postpartum situation where, uh, we are really kind of like going by the baby's um, schedule. Oh, I like that spin on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to try, like, try to find a positive somewhere, right? <laughs> no, but I, I, 
actually, I, I get that. And I like that, like in a weird way, even though you and I were just earlier when we first started chatting, we're like, oh my God, we are living in our own special hell. There is moments, there are, I do have moments where I'm like, oh, it's kind of nice to all have us always together. And that lasts that like that delusional thoughts there for, you know, a few seconds and then someone's well, yelling yeah. at each other. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't do this. She did that. But there is something about coming back to slowing things down, you know? Right. And so that could be in a way it's, it could be really hard, but it does force the new family to slow down and really watch and be with that baby and learn about that baby. And especially, I know a lot of our students, I'm going to put myself out there, I did this, we're just too quick to pick life back up. This prevents right. that. So yeah, I like seeing it's that sort positive. Of we're expected to do. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like what we're expected to do in this society now. But, um, but you know, previously and in a lot of places, it's totally not. Like you are expected to just like, be in a quarantine it's called like for example i'm from the dominican republic and um i don't know if it happens very often anymore but in the past um it was you were like you had your baby and then you were in quarantine and quarantena and that meant 40 days or precisely 41 days of being home and not going out and and then doing all of these other things like not washing your hair not walking by an open window you know, it, it was basically meant to like keep you warm and keep you healing, keep your body, you know, in a state of healing as opposed to a state of um, depletion. So this can be a way for your body to go into a state of healing by just being home and just being with your baby and not doing much other than like hanging out and like, you know, the baby's taking a nap at two o'clock in the afternoon. What else do you have to do? Like you take a nap with the baby, you know? Oh, I'm liking um, this. I like that. Yeah. I like your spin. All right. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I am going to ask you, you've done so much in this field. If there's anything I haven't asked that you want to share, okay, we'll take a super quick break. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, we are back. All right, so we, we've covered so much, and I hope the people out there listening are taking some notes because you really you hit some stuff. And I have to tell you, the, the whole thing you were saying about the Dominican Republic and taking the time in, I love that. Is it something people still do? Is it actually still um, in the culture? Um, I think it depends where you live. So if you live in like more like the countryside uh, and you live like close to your grandmother and your aunties and stuff, then it's something that is expected for you to do. But if you live like in the city, then most people don't, you know, they just, I think that it's still part of the culture in a way, but not in the same way. It's not as restrictive as it was before. So before it was like, you can't walk around barefoot. You can't, you know, like wash your hair. It was all very, very specific. And now it's sort of like, no, you just stay home for 41 days. And then you kind of have your like coming out of that. Um, and I'm not sure like exactly when they see the pediatrician or if pediatricians actually go to their home. Cause I know that people, they do. Um, I know like, for example, I went to, um, attend to my cousin when she had her first baby and we just went to the pediatrician on the way home from the hospital, from the clinic. And then she didn't go back for another couple of weeks. So, um, so it's something that, you know, I think it's still sort of in the culture, but not as as um, strict as it used to be. Can you remind me of when did the first round of shots start? I honestly cannot remember. 
Oh gosh, I think that they start at around three months, but I could be wrong. I think the first ones are the MMR, mm-hmm. but I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about that. Cause by the, you know, by this time I'm mostly done with my clients. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly there for the first six weeks, maybe 10 weeks at the longest. Um, so by the time they're doing shots, I'm mostly, you know, You're on gone. with other yeah. I'm gone. I just remember being at my pediatrician a ton in the beginning. One, we lived two blocks away. The other, we did home births, so we didn't have like a, you know, before you leave the hospital check. So we were there a lot. And then she was slightly concerned about his weight, so we kept going back like, you know, every other day or every three days. But I just remember feeling like we were always there. Um, mm-hmm. so I guess, you know, that's yeah. just not going to happen. So is yeah. there anything I haven't touched on that from your experience, we should unpack a little more, especially planning for people just not having, you know, there's just the isolation. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, like we pay a lot of attention and obviously rightly so to the birthing person and the baby, but if there's another person in the, you know, in the, in the family, like if it's a couple that's bringing a baby, uh, into the world then paying some specific attention to that person as well, um, is really important because they can suffer, you know, like new parent depression as well. Um, they might actually be working from home, which in a way it's like, it's great because they get to be there more often and be around the baby more, but they also have to be not present all the time. And that might be really hard to do. Um, especially if there's like a baby crying in the background and so on. So, so paying particular attention to like their well being can be, um, just as, you know, can be imperative as well. Um, but let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about that too. So if the person that just gave birth is just dealing with that and I totally respect that the partner needs attention, how does the partner get attention? Cause can the new, the person that just gave birth have the energy to deal with the new baby yeah. themselves and the partner? Yeah. I think it's mostly like for the, com- their community to be paying attention, not necessarily the birthing person, but like, because the birthing person is going to be going through so much more, Yeah, uh, especially in the age of COVID. Um, you know, I, I spoke to someone recently and she was like, I had what could be considered a good experience. You know, my partner was there and, um, you know, we got to like be with our our favorite care provider and she was lovely and it was amazing. She was still traumatized, um, by just like being in the hospital in kind of like the hustle and bustle of it all, um, and leaving the hospital and seeing things, you know? So, um, so I think it's not so much for the birthing person to, to be, you know, taking care of the, the partner emotionally, but having the, their community, having their friends and their parents like really pay attention to them as well. Um, because also they're going to be handling a lot of the day-to-day stuff, mm-hmm. um, especially at the very beginning. And that could be, you know, um, I think that could be a, a, a source of extra stress for both partners. You know, if like, I know that a lot of people sometimes feel sort of guilty that all of a sudden their partner has to be doing so much more work than they would have otherwise if they had a postpartum doula or a baby nurse. And now they're like, kind of like in charge of doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so having, having family members and having community that like can really pay attention to that. And then also I would say, um, the other thing that I would, that I, you know, one of the last points that I would bring up is kind of like making noise and having your, your provider. If you think that there's something going on that should not be going on, actually like being there and kind of like niggling your provider about like, Hey, this is happening. I don't think that this is right. This is what's going on. Can you give me some attention? Mm, um, because it's, I think it's going to be a lot easier for people to like fall through the cracks. Um, and it's, um, I think that the providers are going to have just as hard a time as anyone else figuring out like what the virtual world looks like. And they're checking up on people hopefully more often. So they're more, you know, on their phones and on their computers doing like telework. So it might be that it's, um, that it's really hard for them to like really pay complete attention and keep track of like what's going on with every patient, with every 
um, with every new, new family. So, um, if they feel that there's something that's like, you know, I'm not going to go to the hospital for this, but I think that there's something that you need to pay attention to and tell me what to do, you know, then to really be that like, squeaky wheel. Voice up it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think yeah. that's so important. Also, you, I think it's the only way. Yeah. And then you also touched on something that I've been really sitting with, um, with my students is recognizing the anxiety around this. And even if someone, like you mentioned, had a quote unquote, you know, fine birth, you know, they had the provider they wanted, just the anxiety is really going to color their vision of their birth. So giving themselves the time and space to process what they went through because I feel confident nobody had any idea this was going to happen. You know, mm-hmm. everyone, you know, we encourage people to learn and ask questions and have some sort of, you know, birth preferences. And this just throws everything out. And to even, I'm going to even offer the birthing community mourn the fact that you didn't have the birth that you hoped you did. Like it's a real, yeah. it's a loss. And to mm-hmm. give yourself that time to process it. I actually did um, a podcast coming out pretty soon about, um, I think it's called birth medicine, about processing your birth Mm -hmm. instead of just being like, oh, it is what it is. And the baby and I are fine. You know, giving yourself that chance to unpack all of what you went through during this time, creating the new family. Yeah. I think it's a very specifically hard time to be going through it. I I think, you know, labor and birth, um, are its own huge event in mm-hmm. our lives. And it's like the first time that we're having a lot of like those sensations in our bodies, um, having labor pains, you know, is, or even if it's the second or third time, it's still really difficult. Um, and so having to do that while experiencing all of this anxiety, um, and, and, and experiencing the stress of like the people that are around you are, are experiencing as well. Like that has something to do with like our own psyches. Um, I think it's really, really important right now to make sure to do that, to unpack it, to like talk about it, to process it. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been kind of like thinking about, like how, how can we as a, as a birth community provide, because we're not, you know, like I'm not a psychiatrist, psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist. Um, but I think that the need for support and support groups are going to be, it's going to be bigger than ever, you know, the need is going to be, you know, really, really strong. And so what I was kind of like thinking of putting out is, um, an idea of like different, um, births, um, uh, birth community people having smaller support groups, like, so, and then having like, let's say, a calendar or something so that people can be like, okay, it's Tuesday. I'm going to do my labor support with like this person. And then it wouldn't be a bunch of people in the support group. It would be like three or four Mm -hmm. um, so that they can really talk and have a conversation about what, you know, and be able to unpack their, their own experience. Cause if it's like, if you have like 12 people in a, in a support group, you're not going to get to talk. Right. So, yeah. So having this idea on my mind about like, how can we put this together so that people feel heard and people feel, you know, that they, um, that their experience and how they feel about it is valid, but also that they're being, you know, heard and supported Absolutely. and that there's someone out there they can reach out to. Yeah. And I can't, I'm excited for that podcast. I did kind of around this to come out. That will probably come out mm-hmm. next week. Actually, no, um, can't I can't wait to hear it. I know I'm really excited about it. It's from, it's someone from the birthing (laughs) within community and I'm so in that whole methodology. So I think you'll like that. All right. We're going to take one more break. When we come back, I want people to know where to find you and how to reach you. All right. We'll be right back. Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five hour energy. Where will the tide take you sweepstakes? You could win a $10,000 dream beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise. Having fun in the sun or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024. Okay, so you are a wealth of knowledge 
if someone wants Thank to you. reach out to you and talk to you more or look into your doula, your childbirth education, your postpartum doula services, how do they find you? Um, they can go to my website. So my website is nurturinggrace.com and that's with two G's in the middle. So nurturing grace, like the name.com. That's so great. You really are such a gem and I'm so excited. So also community giving you a little bit of background. I had done a podcast with Grace a little over a year ago about preparing for postpartum and I had reached out to her saying, oh, I'm going to re-release it. And then as I had prepared to re-release it, this whole the COVID-19 happened and her yeah. conversation, which eventually I will re-release, had a lot to do with the partner and family and support. And I'm like, this is not yeah. the time to re-release not, None of this is happening right now. None of it. And if I re-release it, people listen be like, well, I don't have the other people coming in. So I wanted to be real with what's going on. And that is why I reached out to Grace and be like, let's change the conversation to be more relevant to what's going on. So I thank you for pivoting so quickly on what I, on what I asked of you. And, and I appreciate it. I appreciate that we are both able to put our kids to sleep and still be functional enough to have a conversation. (laughs) It's very rare. It's very rare that I can like actually speak and be, uh, and make any kind of sense at this point, but you know, here we (laughs) are. I tend to do these evening podcasts um, when I do any sort of conversation with people abroad, especially in in, uh, Australia. I've done several and it is such a struggle. I'm like, I don't make nearly as much sense and I'm not quite as with it at this hour, but we pulled it off. So I'm really happy. Well, thank you for your knowledge and for supporting the birth community how you do. I really appreciate it. You. Thank you so much. And I (laughs) appreciate this opportunity to just like reach out to people and, um, and just like talk about what's going on. Cause it's, um, it's, it's just unprecedented. Yeah, it's huge. So yeah. Thank you so much. Though. Have a good night. Be well. Bye. This has been an episode of yoga birth babies produced by prenatal yoga center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. (gasps) No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.